Welcome. These videos were recorded while I taught econometrics over Zoom, but they were edited so that the student faces, the questions, and my answers to those questions do not appear. That explains why you may notice some unnatural transitions and why the videos are shorter than a normal lecture. But hopefully you enjoy them anyway. Bye now. All right, so we're ready to start, I guess, with lecture seven. Today, we're going to be talking about panel data. Um, and to put it in framework, um, um, you know, right now we're still talking sort of like about the linear model mostly. And last class, we talked about GMM and empirical likelihood. And even though we sort of like said that most of the benefits or the usage of these two estimation methods were in uh, mostly nonlinear models. Um, they, of course, had applications in the linear model as well. But sort of like we deviated from the linear model in a way. Today, we're going to come back um, and we're going to talk in particular about uh, panel data, which is a particular type of data that you can get. And then we're going to talk about the intuition <laughs> as to why we pay particular attention at panel data, what is not just data and period, uh, what's special about it. And then we're going to talk about three estimation uh, methods that are popular. You know, one is called first difference, the other one is demeaning, and the other one is called random effects. The first two kind of like belong to a family of fixed effects. Um, the thing that this the, the terminology in panel data and a lot of things are really outdated in a way, um, given how some of these things are used today. But, you know, we're going to stick to some of the conventions and I'm, I'm going to try to explain as we move forward what are the areas where I think, you know, are really outdated and what are the things that you should uh, probably take away, the main takeaways that are going to be useful if you want to... Uh, to um, implement this method in practice. In terms of theory, you know, the, the literature on panel data has a long time ago deviated mostly from the linear model. And, you know, if you just look at uh, theory papers, they're mostly about nonlinear models and other type of deviations. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start with the basic setting. I'm going to say we're going to have random variables as before, you know, y, x, and the u's. And there's going to be a new guy here that I'm going to denote by eta. So here, y, eta, u are going to be scalar random variables. And x is going to be a vector of covariates of dimension k. As you notice here, these um, vectors before uh, took values in k plus 1. And I use k plus 1 all over the place. But right now, we're not assuming that the first component of x is a constant equal to 1. Um, and, and that is, again, for because it simplifies a lot of the arguments. And in particular, it will allow us to you know, um, deal with this eta over here easily. Um, so then beta, as a consequence of that, is just going to be of dimension k as well. Um, and so... Uh, it's just going to go from 1 to k. And then the model, again, our linear model is going to be y, x, beta, plus eta, plus u. And we're going to assume that both eta and u are unobserved. So in a way, you know, if you want to think about it, is you, you can um, call this error term here b, which is, would be a composite error term. And um, the reason why we're going to we're splitting this error term into two parts is because, you know, under certain assumptions, we're going to be able to say something, okay? But in principle, we could have started with a composite error term B. So I wrote here, we want X and eta to be allowed to be um, correlated, okay? So this expectation here is the main source of things that... Um, we want to allow for. Although in a way, I'm going to say in a minute, uh, um, okay, let me just say that later. So let me finish here. Um, then combining eta plus u into a single unobservable will require an IB to get an estimate of beta, okay? Even if we assume that the expected value of x, u, um, is zero, right? Because if you just go back to this model and you just look at the expected value of x, 
B, well, that is going to be non-zero given this assumption that we have over here. So if we just look at the composite error term, we're go going back to IB and we can use IBs uh, if we have an instrument and so on. The approach that we're going to discuss today is that when we observe the same units, could be individuals, firm, families, etc., multiple times across time, regions, and so on, we may identify and consistently estimate beta without an IB. And that's going to be the point. Even though we're going to have quote unquote endogeneity here, and it's going to be true that the variables that we have are going to be correlated with the composite error term, we're going to be able to identify beta without an IB. Okay. However, that will hold under certain restrictions on eta and u. And I would say panel data in a way is kind of like reverse engineer engineering. It's not that you start with a question and or you know asking yourself what type of endogeneity, heterogeneity I can allow for, and then you just show how you can do it in panel data. It's more like the other way around. You have panel data and then you say like, what can I do with this? Is there something extra that I get from observing the same units over time? And the answer is going to be, well, yes, if, if you assume uh, certain things or at least certain type of endogeneity you can allow for. Oh, great. And then you use it. Okay. That's what we're going to discuss. So I'm going to start with a two period model. I always like to think in two periods uh, to start even when we think about um, later on, diff and diff and so on. Because um, if you get the intuition well of what's going on with two periods, you can extrapolate to all the other time periods. And all that it adds is notation and, you know, algebra. Conceptually, nothing new arises, okay? So suppose that we observe the same unit at two different points in time, okay? And that the unobservable eta captures an observed heterogeneity that is unit-specific that is constant over time. So now, if these are the random variables, I'm just indexing whether they belong to period one or period two. We have that in period one, outcome in period one is a function of the provided in period one, beta, plus this unit specific heterogeneity term that is unobserved, eta, and then um, u1. And then in a period two, you have exactly the same. And the important thing to note is that I said is that this unobserved heterogeneity eta is unit specific and is constant over time. So when you just uh, look at these two equations, you notice that eta is not indexed by one and two because they are the same. The other implicit assumption here, which happens, you know, we know in linear models is that beta is constant, but in this case, it's also a constant parameter that does not change over time. You know, <coughs> in principle, if you wanted to be flexible, you could have said, oh, this is beta one and this is beta two. And then you will have, you would allow, like if we interpret beta as say some form of causal effect, um, you would allow this effect to be different in different time periods. We're not doing that. We're saying there's a there's an effect that is constant over time. Um, and then uh, um, that's what we're gonna try to identify and estimate. So a simple approach when you look at this is to take um, first difference. So I'm going to take this second equation and I'm going to subtract the first one. And this is going to lead to um, y2 minus y1. And it's going to be just x2 minus x1 prime beta plus u2 plus minus, sorry, u1. And then I'm going to write this as delta y equals delta x prime beta plus delta u, where I'm going to define delta y as just y2 minus y1. And the same for the other two. I'm going to write the x here, x2 minus x1. Of course, same for u. So by doing this, just taking these two equations and subtracting one from the other one, we got rid of eta, okay? And so it's a simple trick, um, but it's a convenient trick because now on this equation that we obtained 
at the end, uh, well, we have an outcome, which in this case is delta y. We have observed covariates, which are the delta x, and then we have an unobserved term, which is delta u. So for, for something um, like uh, least squares to work, we need the expected value of delta x times delta y, delta u, sorry, is zero. And this, you know, you can write a expected value of x2 u2 plus an expected value of x1 u1 minus expected value of x2 u1 minus expected value of x1 u2. And then when you look at this, you can see that the first two terms over here are the, the usual ones that we assume, say, zero, as an assumption of exogeneity. So we say the x's are exogenous. So we make this type of assumptions. But now we also have this type of terms over here, right? Which is a statement about the correlation between covariates tomorrow, uh, given whatever unobservables we had yesterday, and covariance today, given unobservables we will have tomorrow. And so that doesn't follow from the usual um, exogeneity assumptions that we have. They inherently right now have some dynamic interpretation and um, we need to think about them if we want to claim something like uh, this expectation over here is zero. But assuming that we do, okay, the main point here is that we just took first difference and then, you know, we claim some exogeneity conditions between the x's and the u, and then we identify beta. And so without the use of an instrument, okay? So it's just by doing a manipulation of the data that arises for observing the same unit multiple times and by making a specific assumption about what type of unobserved heterogene heterogeneity we can allow for, in this case, one that is unit specific and constant over time, then you can see that this approach will work. So if you go back and split again, and you look at this expectation that I just wrote in the previous slide, then I wrote here for the expression above to be equal to zero, we need the usual, I wrote here the standard orthogonality assumption, uh, which is expected value of x, u when they are, belong to the same time period to be equal to zero. But we also need this second part, okay, which is a statement about covariates and error terms or unobservables in different time periods, okay? And if you put the two together, one plus two, you call this strict exogeneity. And this is sort of like the type of assumptions that we're going to use today. Depending on the setting, depending on the estimator that you're using, sometimes you can weak, weaken some of these conditions a bit and, and take into account only one direction, you know, unobservables tomorrow with error terms with covariance today or the like. I'm not going to get into those details because, you know, uh, they're easy to understand if you understand the main point uh, that we're trying to make here. But then under one and two, as I said, you can just do least squares of delta y on delta x. And then by using the same manipulations that we said before, provided this matrix here is invertible, okay, then you can do the same manipulations with it in the first and second lecture and solve for beta and see that the true beta solved this. And once you have a representation of beta and at this level in the population, not hard to see how you would derive an estimator. It will just replace the expectations with sample averages, and there you have your least squares estimator. So a couple of remarks that are important are that, you know, the this unobserved heterogeneity that we allow for, that we could capture by doing this manipulation was uh, constant over time, okay? So I wrote here, observing the same unit over multiple time periods, okay, the so-called panel data, allow us to control for and observe factors that are constant over time, 
Okay, so it's not any type of unobserved heterogeneity. If you just think about a context in which you think that there's heterogeneity that varies both across individuals and across over time, well, that will have to be part of the U, okay? And that means that you will have to make the assumptions there as that you make about the U's. Uh, but, you know, by just having this uh, data structure, you can account for a particular type of unobserved heterogeneity. These that are like unit specific and that they stay constant over time. And in many settings, this makes sense. And these are things that you may be worried about. And so this is a great feature of panel data. Okay, the trick, as I wrote here, <coughs> if you just use the manipulation with it, uh, will not work if eta is allowed to change over time because you will just have eta two minus eta one, it will be there, it's correlated with x, and you will need an instrument. Um, the other point that is important is that you need your covariates to change over time. So we said the end of circuit heterogeneity has to be constant over time. Well, we're also saying the variables that we do observe, they need to change over time. Uh, why am I saying that? Well, because we wrote a requirement that the spective value of delta x, delta x prime is invertible, as I said in the last expression. Well, this implies that x changes over time because we're taking a difference. If x was constant over time, okay, then you would just take the difference, you will get zero, and then this thing will not be invertible. So the tricks does not allow us to use or estimate coefficients of variables that are constant over time. If you want, you could split, uh, partition the x's as we did in the second lecture into x1 and x2, and suppose you collapse into x1, all the covariates that are uh, the uh, change over time, they have time variation, and then you collect in x2 all the variables that are constant over time, uh, gender, let's say. Um, then uh, when you take the difference, okay, you're just going to wipe out those variables, and so um, you're not going to be able to identify uh, those components. So <clears throat> we need to assume that the unobserved heterogeneity is constant over time, the things that we observe and can identify are uh, varying over time. And then the other thing is to note is that now when we say that the covariates are exogenous, well, it's sort of like a stronger version of exogeneity, that's why it's called strict exogeneity. And the thing is that in some cases, I wrote here where x2 is a decision variable of an agent, so, um, you know, think about depending on the context what that could be, but suppose that agent in every uh, peer is making decisions and X2 is one of these decisions. And then, you know, decisions today may depend on unobservables that you observe tomorrow, even if they don't depend on the unobservables that you have today. But, you know, something happened yesterday maybe affects what you're deciding today. And so this assumption over here, then, you know, in some settings could be delicate, okay? Because if X are choices, then you're saying the choices today are not affected by unobservables, or you may call them shocks, in, depending on the application that happened yesterday. So this could be a strong assumption in some settings, okay? Know that this type of dynamic argument that I'm describing here is distinct from the omitted variable bias that we typically discuss, okay? So here, as I said, you have a new type of consideration that is um, intrinsically dynamic, okay? All right. Questions. So we're going to talk about fixed effects now. <clears throat> and then we're going to start with an approach that is called first difference. Okay. First differences, FD, I'm going to say. So setting the same as before. Okay. But now we're going to let P be the distribution of the Y's and the X's for each individual. So we're letting P the distribution of the random variables for units, okay? Where for a unit, you have their entire history. So for unit i, I can see all the history of the outcome from period one to period t, and then for the covariates from period one to period t. Um, we're gonna assume that we have a random sample of size n. So the observed data, you can write it like this, and here I wrote random sample, so we're going to assume that these individuals or units, you know, as I said, could be individuals, families, companies, firms, and so on, are independent. And that they come from the same distribution. That's the IID thing. However, we are being agnostic about the dependence over time. Since we're sampling individuals with their entire history, we're not saying anything about how, whatever, Y1 relates to Y2 and Y2 to YT and so on. 
not we're not saying anything so uh this is important we're just going to assume that units are independent then we're going to write the model as we wrote it before now i'm going to index observations by units and time and we're going to have yit is xit prime beta plus eta i plus uit and then we index as i said from units from one to n time periods from one to t and we're going to take first difference this is the same trick that we did before for a unit of time t uh, we're going to say t minus t minus one so this is fine uh starting at t equal to two okay and then we do that we're just applying first difference to that equation and then we uh, recall that since eta is indexed by i, but it is not indexed by t because we said that it is constant over time, then we wiped out the eta by taking first difference. And so we end up with this relationship over here that goes from all the units and time periods from 2 to t. So we're going to need some assumptions to make this work. And um, in particular, what we're going to do at the end of the day is just to run a regression of delta y on delta x, okay, so that we can obtain beta. For that, we're going to need essentially two assumptions, okay? First one we're going to assume is we're going to call fd1 is that the perspective value of uit conditional on the entire axis of individual i that includes xi1 dot 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 xit is zero for all t. So let me just talk about this in a second. And then FD2 is just going to be the sum from 2 to T of the expected value of delta X, delta X prime is finite and invertible. Okay. Um, so FD1 is sufficient for this condition over here, which is that the expected value of delta U, delta X is zero for all T. So in principle, we could have just assumed this, okay? Um, and the reason why I want to stick to FD1 is twofold. The first one is, you know, if you just go too many of the references on panel data, that's the assumption that you're going to see and whatever. And the second one is that um, it's just going to make, it's going to make it easier to compare these assumptions between this approach and, and the dominion approach, which at the end of the day, even though, you know, you can say, well, this is stronger than this. Um, at the end of the day, it's just going to be hard to interpret something like this without assuming something like this. So it just makes sense. And FD2 is the assumption that we used before. Before, we didn't have the sum because we only had two time periods. So it's just this term. But essentially, fails if some component does not vary over time. And then here you have a sum over t. So you need to vary from 1 to 2, from 2 to 3, to 3 to 4, to 4 to 5, and so on. So... What is the first difference estimator? The first difference estimator, as I said that before, is just replace expectations with sample averages. Now we have time periods and units, so you see this double sum here. Other than that, it's exactly these squares. You're just doing these squares of delta y on delta x, and that's what this first difference estimator is. Something that I'm going to discuss as I move along today is this statements of efficiency that you're going to find in a lot of books. And all of you that took courses that cover panel data before probably had a discussion on this. Um, so we're, we're going to try to clarify what it means and what's the extent of this and the scope to which you should pay attention to something like this. But I wrote here under the assumption that the variance of U conditional on all the axes is constant, which is a homoscedasticity assumption together with the assumption of no serial correlation in the U, so we're going to assume that these U's are independent over time, it is possible to show that F hat FD, which is our guy over here, is not asymptotically efficient, and that the diff a different transformation of the data delivers an estimator with a lower asymptotic variance under these assumptions, the homoscasticity and the no serial correlation, okay? Um, we're going to see what that estimator is next, okay? And then we're going to discuss whether this is uh, an important consideration to take into account or not. Questions about the first difference estimator? All right. So the next one is the meaning estimator. Um, and essentially, it's just going to be 
a different group of transformations that will allow us to accomplish the same goal, which is to estimate and identify beta without using an instrument. So the meaning, well, that's what I wrote here. It's an alternative transformation to remove these individual effects L to I. <clears throat> We're going to define this notation. Every time I grab a random variable, put a dot on top, which is this guy over here, is going to denote the difference between that variable and the average across time of that unit. Okay, so here x bar i, it's just the sum over t and divided by one divided by t of x i t. Okay, so for each unit and time, we subtract the average over time. Whoops. Um, and then analogously, we can define y dot and u dot. So the first thing to know is, that as you know, in the case of the first difference is delta, sorry, eta dot is zero for all i, okay? Because of course, eta, you're going to be doing eta i minus the average of eta i over time, which is eta i. So you have eta i minus eta i, zero. Great. So you apply these transformations on both sides of our original equation. And then we have dot y, dot x, dot u, and we are good to go. We got rid of the eta's. So now the idea is that we want to run a regression of delta uh, of dot y on dot x and get a consistent, uh, an estimator of beta. We can do that under two assumptions. I'm gonna call them fe1 and fe2. So fe1 is exactly the same assumption we had before that we denoted as fd1. The role here is going to be different. I'm not discussing it in a minute, but it's the same type of exogenated condition. And so FD2 is very similar, though not the same. Now we're going to require that this expectation, which is the dot dot prime, is finite and invertible. So why this one? Well, clearly because this is the one that is going to pop up in the least squares formula uh, in this setting where we use this transformation. But um, conceptually, this type of condition is going to require kind of like the same behavior from the x's as fd2. So the assumptions are not that different, okay? So fe1 is the same condition as fd1, which is sufficient here to, uh, to have uh, this. We know the expected value of dot u dot x being equal to zero. Well, you know, as I said before, we require expected value of delta x, delta u being uh, zero. And so when you write it like that, you know, it's, they look different. And of course you could cook up DGPs where one hole perhaps and not the other one. But uh, in principle, um, that's why it's easier or convenient to just think about an assumption like this. It gives you both uh, for first difference and uh, the demeaning estimator. And Fe2 fails again if some component of x does not vary over time. So it's requiring the same thing. You need the variables to vary over time. So what is the so-called fixed effects estimator or the meaning estimator or sometimes the dummy variable estimator? Well, just do these squares, replace the expectations with sample averages. And so now we have this double sum and we have the dot variables here and here. Other than that, it just looks like uh, least squares. So under the assumptions that the variance is constant, this homoscasticity, together with the assumption of no zero correlation in U, it is possible to show that the fixed effects estimator is asymptotically efficient, okay? But again, we're gonna discuss this in a minute. So now we're gonna study the asymptotic properties. I essentially want to have um, uh, the limited distribution of this fixed effect estimator or the meaning estimator, which is uh, popular in, popular in practice. And then I wrote here, asymptotic approximations in panel data models um, have two elements that were not present in the cross-sectional analysis that we've done so far. The first one is that the data is IID across I, but may be dependent across time. So, and that affects, you know, how we think about law of large numbers and central limit theorems and estimators of the asymptotic variance. Okay, so you have to be careful whenever that arises. Two, here the data has two indices, the number of units and the number of time periods. And so you have to think about what does it mean for the number of observations to grow? So as I said here, the requirement is that n times t, which is your entire data set, 
um, goes to infinity. But the thing is that you may achieve this by all sort of different assumptions about how n and t grow, right? So you can imagine n goes to infinity, t is fixed, n goes to infinity, t goes to infinity, t goes to infinity, n is fixed. Um, they go at the same rate, at different rates. One is faster than the other one, blah, blah, blah. There are a lot of different ways in which now you can take into account what it means for something like n times t to go to infinity. Out of all that world, um, there are two that are more prominent. One is that they call short panels, which are asymptotics in which the number of units goes to infinity, and t is fixed. And this is traditionally the asymptotic framework in panel data, partly because if you just think about the type of data that was available at the time, or even today, it is quite commonly the case, if you think about, for example, survey data, which is a common way of obtaining panel data, well, you have a lot of units, a lot of individuals, and very few waves or time periods. And so, you know, when people start thinking about asymptotics, you're using asymptotics always to approximate a finite sample phenomenon. So if you just see that your data set <clears throat> has 300,000 units and 10 time periods, well, it makes sense to just do asymptotics in which n is really large and t is not. Now, and other type of applications, okay, that are sometimes more macro-oriented and so on, you have both. You have that a lot of units, and then you have a long time series. And so when that's the case, then it makes sense to just uh, consider both and see what's happening, okay? Today, uh, we're going to stick to the traditional one of short panels, okay? Uh, mostly because um, two reasons. One, it's simpler, okay? Two, it's the asymptotics that justify most of the... Um, a formula that you're going to be using later on. In particular, for example, the ones that are behind data and so on uh, fall into this type of asymptotics, okay? So you need to understand that. So on the asymptotics where n goes to infinity and, and t is fixed, um, you can show that the fixed effects and the first difference estimators are asymptotically normal using similar arguments to those used before, provided we assume that, you know, the observations are iid across i. So what we're going to be exploiting is that across units, we have IID, and we can use, as I said, law of large numbers and set limit theorems as we were using before. We sort of like have to just be sure to, um, you know, collapse or, uh, in a way, take into account everything that depends on T on the side, okay? So it doesn't bother us as we move forward. So we're going to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to prove that um, the fixed effects estimators are asymptotically normal, and um, the arguments for the first difference are, are very similar, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just stick to this one. So let's get started. I'm going to use um, two tricks. And once we have these two tricks, um, we're going to be fine. The first one is... Um, that I'll look at um, this object over here. And then we're going to have that the sum t equals 1 to t xit dot uit dot. And I'm going to write again as the sum from 1 to t of x dot i t and I'm gonna write this as u i t minus u bar i okay and so <clears throat> this equals the sum t equals one to t x dot i t u i t minus u bar i which doesn't depend on t sum t one to capital t of x dot i t okay and then this guy over here is zero 
by definition of the x dot. And so what we end up at the end of the day with is that we can write this last term using a u that doesn't have a dot. And that's going to be convenient. Okay. So the point of this first trick is that when you look at this term, the sum of t of x dot u dot, well, that's exactly the same as if the u doesn't have a dot. Okay. That's all we did. The u doesn't have a dot. So that's the first trick. The second one, uh, I'm going to say let's stack the x's of unit i. So let me write xi as, I don't know, xi1 prime, xi2 prime, dot, dot, dot x i t prime prime which is k times t so i stuck all the observations of unit i okay and then i forgot to uh, include the dots here this is dots 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 then we stuck all the observations of unit um of unit i in two columns so the, the the first time period is here and then the second one and then the third one and then we obtain a matrix that is dimension k which is the number of covariates that we have times t which is the time periods that we have and so the cool thing about this is that now if we just look at this object i'm going to do x dot i prime x dot i well, this is the sum of t from 1 to t of x dot i t, x dot i t prime. And so, in other words, we're just saying you can write this sums over t as a product of um, <clears throat> observations, okay? of, uh, sorry, matrices. And so also we know that X prime UI is the sum from T1 to T of X dot IT UIT. And this is great because now I can just go and write all this as squared and beta hat f e minus beta business as follows I have one over n sum from one to n of x dot i prime x dot i inverse one over square root n sum from one to n of x dot i prime ui and this is nice because as i said before in a way using this notation now we got rid of the things that depend on t okay they're just collapsed into this stack vectors and um we just have an expression that has sums over i and they're indexed by i at the same time we got rid of the transformation on the use that had the dot. So we have a U here that doesn't have a dot and that's going to be convenient. And so the first step improving the, or deriving the asymptotic distribution of the fixed effects estimator involves essentially writing this expression in a way that is convenient. And that's what we just did. So here's the guy rewriting and then we can say okay now um we can say by the weak law of large numbers we have that one over n 
sum from 1 to n of x dot i prime x i dot converges in probability and again this is as n goes to infinity to the expected value of x dot i prime x dot i which you can write this as the sum of t1 to t of the expected value of x dot i t x dot i t prime by the derivation we did in the previous page okay and this is finite because this is one of our assumptions the data is id across i so we can uh uh, we can do this and then also you'll notice here that there's a sum from 1 to t here this is just fine because t is fixed in our asymptotics okay otherwise of you know if, if when you see that you know so students make mistakes in exam or in homework they just do some asymptotics take n to infinity and that with an expression on the right hand side that depends on n well that can happen because just essentially took n to infinity but i'm saying here we're doing asymptotics when n goes to infinity but t is fixed so is there's no problem to see something that depends on t capital t um on the right hand side and that's what happens here because this is the framework that we're using now we look at the CLT and I'm say by the CLT we're gonna we're having that one over square root n sum from one to n x dot i dot u i conversion distribution to a normal with mean zero and variance that I'm gonna call omega okay where omega is um the variance of this object and then um, you can write it also as expected value of x dot i prime ui ui prime x dot i and of course you can write it also as a function of x i t by just summing it over t we're not going to do that i'm going to stop there and then if we let let me call um sigma x dot this expectation that we wrote here at the top and use the continuous mapping theorem then we have that a square root n beta hat f e n minus beta conversion distribution as n goes to infinity to a normal with mean zero and variance b where b is sigma x dot inverse omega sigma x dot inverse Cute. So that's the result. Um, I'm restating it here. Same thing. So here I call beta f e to distinguish from other betas, and and I wrote the following. Historically, researchers often assumed that u was serially uncorrelated with variance independent of x, homoscedastic. The false standards in theta are still based on these assumptions. Um. Most common strategy, however, is not to use whatever data reports, is to use the fully uh, robust consistent estimator of the asymptotic variance. That is, you know, just look at the expressions, replace the use with the hats, and replace the rest with averages. So the good estimator of the asymptotic variance of the fixed effects estimator is this one over here, which again takes a usual sandwich form if you look, it's exactly the objects that we imagine and you would imagine seeing, okay? Um, uh, if you look at the expression that we had, for example, for omega and this sigmas, right? This omega, 
and this is the sigma. But what you're doing is just estimating that with sample averages. Okay, where again, the main issue is that you're not using the true use, you're using the residuals, okay? And so when you use the residuals, you know, uh, the proof of whether this worked and there was assumptions and so on is delicate. We're gonna devote an entire class on this formula, okay, after the midterm. And um, these are called uh, cluster covariance estimator, cluster robust standard errors, and in Stata, you can use this by calling the option cluster unit at the end, okay? So so that you get this. Um, it's, again, to me, why? And then this not this not to take it on Stata, like um, R, for example, if you just use the four things, also uses this default uh, standard errors. Uh, I think is a crime. I think that um, in in we are at the point in which all this software should make something like this the default. And then if you just want to assume extra and want to impose some additional assumptions, you have the option to go comma homoscedasticity or something like that. And then that'll be a lot better uh, because unfortunately people sometimes don't pay attention to how things are being computed in the softwares that they use. And so they just get numbers that really don't make any sense or they make sense under assumptions that most people don't want to assume. So um, this estimator generalizes the heteroscedasticity consistent estimator that we discussed at some point, and again we're going to see in detail after the midterm, and is known as the cluster covariance estimator (CCE). So you're often going to see CCE, cluster covariance estimator. Um, it's, again, some people call it cluster robust standard errors, and you can show in the same arguments that we're going to use later that this estimator is consistent for this asymptotic variance as n goes to infinity. In particular, as in this asymptotic framework where n goes to infinity and t doesn't grow. But we're going to consider a lot of other frameworks when we get to that point. For now, this is what I want you to understand, that this estimator has this asymptotic variance, the variance takes the sandwich form as usual, and that the, the good estimate of this um, variance that doesn't require additional assumptions is this... Uh, one that requires the cluster unit option in Stata and um, possibly some other option in R that I don't remember. All right, so let's uh, finish this discussion on efficiency. Um, I wrote here traditional arguments in favor of the fixed effects or within group estimator over the first different estimator, rely on the fact that under homoscedasticity and no zero correlation, F hat Fe has a lower asymptotic variance than the first different estimator. What's the intuition? Well, think about it. When you take first differences, if the U is really nice, in particular is IID, okay, then you introduce serial dependence. Because when you compute the, the difference and then you compute the correlation between delta UIT and delta UIT minus one, well, split this up, you're gonna have these four terms, and guess what? One of them, over here are the same. And so that's the variance of UIT minus one. And so you induce negative correlation, okay? So the intuition is that, oh, look, uh, if you had a really nice error term and you take first differences, you may be introducing uh, serial dependence. So be careful, uh, you know, the FE estimator doesn't do that. Well, sure, but as I wrote here, I could come up with a different uh, story, right? What if the U that you have in your model actually is very serially correlated? Let's take it to the extreme. It's a random walk. So UIT is UIT minus one plus some really nice shock. Well, in that case, when you take the first difference, you get the really nice shock. And in a situation like this, the first difference estimator is just gonna work better than the uh, fixed effects estimator. And even this comparison that I'm making over here, if you do it formally, uh, may still depend on homoscedasticity, which is an assumption that you don't want to make in either case. So at the end of the day, if you're gonna choose fixed effects over first differences, there are arguments. Most of the time are convenience, you know, popularity. Actually, first difference is very popular in dynamic settings and in difference in differences, which we're gonna talk about later. Whereas like when just people estimate panel data in general, the demeaning technique is uh, the one that is most popular claiming that you're using one because you believe that it is more efficient than the other one 
is kind of again ridiculous from my point of view because you know that claim only holds under assumptions that are like really strong okay and so again um but if you're just willing to assume those assumptions because there are reasons for you to believe that those make sense then this is how it works out under homoscasticity and no serial correlation this is the reason why you will prefer something that fixed effects if you believe you have a lot of dependence then this is you know a reason to perhaps consider something like first differences um you know other than this uh these are two good choices to estimate a panel data model and most often they deliver very similar numbers in fact as i wrote here when t is two okay specific case these two estimators are numerically the same okay so there's not even a difference um so of course when t is not two they have difference but differences but most of the time are not really meaningful okay questions all right so let's keep going now uh we're going to talk about yet another approach that is known as random effects so we're going to go back to the model that we wrote before it's the y the x's the eta's the u's eta's do not vary over time we have units and time and random effects models um at the following assumption boom the eta is uncorrelated with the x's um and honestly i uh, in, you can't imagine how many times i said to myself like well once i get to this line I should stop and move on and just say there's no point to discuss this but I'm going to do it because some of you were exposed to this and may have questions. So let's do it. Meaning, an observable time variable factors that were being controlled for in the fixed effects approach are now assumed to be mean independent. So uncorrelated with the covariates are all time periods. Okay. So now again, well, I wrote this here. I was going to write it, but um, the strict discussionary condition for the fixed effects approach, okay, FE1, is still maintained. So the use are still and correlated with the x's so that if you aggregate the error term which is this guy over here b eta plus u well this error term now satisfies this condition okay well what does it follow from here just do all s let's just go to run a regression of y on x and then the squares using all the observations time and units and so on and it's going to work out because is, there's no point for you, if you care about identifying beta, to view this as a separate thing, just write as B I T. Everything is exogenous, everything is nice, just do these squares. You will need the X's to have, you know, the usual uh expected value of X, X prime, uh, finite, and so on. But other than this, just do these squares. So what's this business over here? The idea behind random effects is to exploit the serial correlation in B that is generated by the common shock eta under some fairly strong assumptions with the goal of improving efficiency. So I wanna highlight here efficiency and fairly strong assumptions. What are these assumptions? I'm gonna collapse all this into something that I call RE2. RE2, sounds like a robot, but anyway. So, it's the variance of u given x is just going to be sigma square u. The variance of eta given x is just sigma square eta. So we have homoscasticity assumptions on u and eta. Then we have no serial correlation of the u's, no correlation between the u's and the eta. So, okay, this is just so strong. Like you take the conditional variance of b given the x's. <coughs> well, this is just the expected value of e squared. So it's you know, eta square, u square, and the interaction. Well, the interaction is zero, and each of these two is sigma uh, eta and sigma u. And now you compute the covariance between b i t and b i s, whatever t and s are, any two time periods. Then again, you work out the product, and then you have the four terms that usually pop up. And look at this. This is u at t and s, well, they're serially uncorrelated, so this will be zero, the expectation. This is eta u. We have eta u here, so once we take the expectations, this will be zero. We have eta u here again, so we have this sigma square eta. So we have something 
sometimes call um, whatever um, equicorrelation. Okay. And then this looks something like this then when you just do the expected value of B, B prime conditional on the axis. You're going to obtain a matrix that is just going to look like this. As sigma squared eta plus sigma squared u in the diagonal. Sigma squared eta plus sigma squared u dot. Sigma squared eta plus sigma squared u. Right? Which is this term that we got over here. And then you're going to have sigma squared eta everywhere else. Sigma squared eta. So that's, that's how this matrix looks like. It has this term in the diagonal and outside the diagonal has this just sigma square eta everywhere. The correlation is equicorrelation. All the shocks are equally correlated because the only source of, an, of correlation is the common shock, the common shock that we call sigma square eta. Okay, now what? Well, first we can write this more succinctly. So six omega, which is this matrix that I just wrote, okay, is, did I write it correctly? Yeah. Um, you can write it like this, sigma square u times the identity matrix plus sigma square eta times a matrix that is all ones. All right, and it's just not difficult to see that this delivers this, the matrix that I wrote um, before. And the random effects estimator is the estimator that essentially weights by this matrix over here has the lowest asymptotic variance under these assumptions that we are saying, okay? Where here X, again, is T times K vector of stack observations as before. So what is this? This is just, if, if you heard about this, the generalized least squares estimator. Just least square would you just weight observations in some way. Here, the way comes from this matrix omega inverse. So this GLS estimator is invisible since we don't know omega, okay? And this omega, um, you know, even though is of dimension, you know, um, um, T times T, um, it's, it's really only depends on two parameters, right? We know that it depends only on sigma square U and sigma square eta. So the only unknown parameters are those two. So if we can estimate these unknown parameters, then we're gonna have an omega hat. And then once we have this omega hat, we can just do feasible GLS. And that would be the so-called feasible random effect estimator of beta. So at the end of the day, we could have done least squares. We're not doing least squares because we think that we know something about the error structure and the, the, the variance covariance metric of the error structure that we can exploit to get a better estimator. And that's what we call the random effects estimator. And this structure not only is something that we know, it also happens to have a very simple structure because you know it only depends on two parameters. There's sigma eta, sigma u. And so if we estimate two parameters, we can just make all this operational. Operational. So, what are the remarks? First, deficiency gains hold under the additional structure followed by RE1. So, if you just, you know, we started our discussion saying panel data is great because it allows us to account for certain type of unobserved heterogeneity, while well, random effects is not doing that. Second, deficiency gains that uh, hold under homoskiasticity and independence assumptions in RE2 and do not hold more generally. So yeah, we're saying, oh, panel data will allow us to like, you know, get a better estimator of beta. Even though you could do least squares, you can get a better estimator. Well, yes, you can get a better estimator under that assumption in RE2, which happens to be really strong. Third, unlike the fixed effects estimator, the random effects approach allows to estimate regression coefficients associated with time invariant covariates. Uh, that's a plus because here we're not doing any transformation, we're not demeaning, we're not taking first differences. So if we have variables that are constant over time, we could estimate the betas associated 
with those variables, whereas we can't do that with the other two approaches. Fourth, under RE1 and RE2, beta is identified in a single cross-section. The parameter that requires panel data for identification in this model are the variances of the components, that is the sigma square eta and the sigma square u. As we said at the beginning, you don't need the panel data. Imagine that you observe individuals for three time periods. You can just take one time period. You can just run least squares. You obtain an estimator of beta. You identify beta. So why do you need the time periods? Well, you use the variation over time to identify these parameters over here. Okay, how do you estimate these parameters? That's the part I'm not covering because, you know, uh, I don't think it's worth devoting time to something like that, but you could do it, okay? And so um, at the end of the day, all that random effects is giving you is a better estimator than least squares under this list of assumptions in RE2 while sacrificing the main benefits that we said before that we had for panel data, which was to allow eta and x to be correlated. Finally, the terminology fixed effects and random effects is arguably confusing because eta is random in both approaches. Now, Suppose that you're just stubborn, and then you still think that there are reasons to pay a lot of attention to random effects. Well, if you keep reading your book, you're going to hopefully, or at some point, uh, you're going to learn about Hausmann specification tests. So what's the idea behind Hausmann specification tests? Well, you're going to compare the fixed effects and the random effects estimator, okay, in a way to test the validity of RE1, okay? RE1 is the assumption that said that the expected value of eta conditional x is zero, okay? And so what's, what's the rationale for doing this? Well, you're gonna say because under the null hypothesis that RE1 holds, meaning you have an observed heterogeneity that is independent of the axis, both estimators are consistent, the random effects and the fixed effects, because there's no um, heterogeneity that is correlated with your axis. There's no endogeneity problem. However, the random effects is efficient, okay? Again, assuming RE2 holds here. So if you have this type of heterogeneity, there's an argument to say, oh, you want to use the random effects because it's better. However, under the alternative hypothesis, the fixed effects is consistent while the random effects is not. So the Hausmann test is just going to test the hypothesis, okay? That this is the null hypothesis, and then if it rejects, it's gonna say use fixed effects. If it doesn't reject, it's gonna say use random effects because those are more efficient. So you can define your estimator like this, and this is the estimator that you would obtain out of this process, which again, you can write as, you know, Hausmann task, and then, you know, reject, do not reject, okay? And then you can write as this uh, random effect, uh, this fix effect. And I told you before that whenever you are following decision trees like this using tests, okay, this is always problematic. In this context, if you define your estimator as beta hat star, beta hat star n, which is actually the estimator you will be using by doing this, you will be using fixed effects provided the Hausmann test rejects, or you'll be using random effects provided the Hausmann test accepts. And you start analyzing the properties of this estimator well, this estimator doesn't share the properties of this. This estimator doesn't share the property of this because it's just a mixture of the two. And it happens that the final sample distribution look very different from the normal approximation. Even under all these assumptions that I'm saying here, RE1, RE2. So the use of uh, beta hat star should be avoided because you know, you're gonna get an estimator at the end of the day that is not gonna have the properties that you claim it has, okay? Last year, one of the CEDRIC evaluation complained about me saying stuff like this, sort of like detail about how I said that things should not be used or should not be avoided without actually proving it. Well, there's a reason why I'm not proving it because to prove this formally, you need to get into the so-called topic of uniformity, which is way beyond the scope of this class and derivations that you know take a long time. 
However, um, I cover some of these things in 481. So if you're just really curious and then you want to learn more about it, well, you could take 481. And also, I have references. And if you're really curious, I can tell you what are the papers that actually do this. And there's, for example, there's one paper that tackles this particular problem, how this works poorly. Um, but in other case, I think that regardless of the problems that you have for doing pre-testing, which is this type of situations called pre-testing that are well known, I don't see still a reason why you will want to do this because I don't see a reason to really be in love with the random effects estimator. There could be reasons in some specific settings. I'm not saying that this is 100% useless, but most of the time, if your concern is to be robust to some type of unobserved heterogeneity and the like, then I don't see a reason for assuming RE1, and I never see a reason for assuming RE2, assuming RE2. Questions before we move to dynamic. All right. We got to the last part of today's class. We're about to finish. Um, I'm just going to touch briefly on dynamic models, okay? Why? Well, for two reasons. One is that this is something that panel data gives you that is not present in... in um, um, cross-sectional data, which, you know, you could exploit and may be meaningful in your application too, because there are a couple of issues that arise in this particular case that did not arise in everything that we discussed up until this point. I wrote here, one benefit of panel data is that allow us to uh, analyze relationships that are inherently dynamic, okay? So we're going to view the simplest version of that, which is the model where you only have outcomes, okay? And you can see yit is row yt minus one plus a to i plus u, okay? So yit minus one has a direct effect of yit, a feature that is sometimes referred to state dependence, okay? Um, and, you know, you can imagine that, for example, uh, your, your, um, the, your um, you being unemployed today may depend on whether you were unemployed yesterday. Uh, your income today depend on your income yesterday and so on. Of course, you could have covariates and other things, but let's keep it simple. Okay. So, um, in, in, you know, if you just come from a, like a time series macro, you know, people are going to talk about auto regressive models. If you just come from for the labor and other type of literature, people talk about state dependence. Okay. How your, uh, your state today depends on things that you did yesterday. Uh, we're going to assume that the absolute value of rho is less than one and that the model is dynamic complete is called, and then meaning this, the expected value of uit, notice here that there's a t, okay, it's not, uh, it's mean independent of all the outcomes that happen before t, uh, t minus one, t minus two, and so on. Of course, at t, you have the relationship given over here, and at t plus one, you're going to have uh, dependence because, you know, ut fits uh, yt, and yt fits yt minus one, and so on. So what's the easiest thing to do with this model? Well, take first differences, okay? So we take first difference. And again, why do we take first difference? Just let's recap. Well, we have this eta. We do want to have these two features and you're gonna have papers published, you know, a couple of years ago in Econometrica, just dealing with state dependence and unobserved heterogeneity, which is, this is the baby version of something like that. You have state dependence, you have unobserved heterogeneity, okay? And so dealing with both presents issues. So here we're gonna see it in the context of this model. So first differences are the way for us to get rid of the unobserved heterogeneity. Um, of course, we still have the state dependence here because we have delta yt is rho delta yt minus one. The problem with this is the following. If we were aiming to do something like least squares, we, uh, we need the covariance of this and this to be zero. So let's write that out. Uh, we have the covariance of delta y i t minus one and delta u i t. And this is the covariance of um, y i t minus one minus y i t minus two and then u i t minus u i t minus one. And then you can split the terms 
We're going to have the covariance of yi t minus 1 on uit minus the covariance of yi t minus 2 uit minus the covariance of yi t minus 1 ui t minus 1 plus the covariance whoa it doesn't fit yit minus 2 uit minus 1 okay let's make it fit covariance yit minus 2 uit minus 1 and then the assumptions that we have said, look, this is zero, okay, because you have yt and yt minus one. Uh, this is zero because it's ut uh, yt minus two. Sorry, this is ut yt minus one, ut yt minus two. And then here we have ut minus one, yt minus two. So this is zero. And again, all using this assumption over here. But then you end up with this term. And this term is not zero. So all this to say, yes, you have a model with an observed heterogeneity and state dependence. You can take first differences as we did before, but now we introduce endogeneity and a different type of endogeneity. It wasn't, you know, that, that is not related to eta. Eta doesn't appear here. And we're assuming that U and, and Y are sufficiently exogenous in a way. But the problem is that there's the dynamic aspect here that makes that, um, when you take the differences, you introduce a correlation term that includes y t minus one and u t minus one, and of course those are correlated given the main equation that we have. So, what's going on? Well, um, this is the model that I wrote again i wrote here similar problems with the mean transformations okay it doesn't matter we use first differences but we could have done something else this inherent endogeneity is a genetic feature of models that have both state dependence and time invariant heterogeneity which is something that i said already and the solution that you could do is to use lagged outcomes as instruments so y i t minus two so why does that work well for the instrument to work we know that we require two conditions. We need an exogeneity and relevance. So let's think about exogeneity. Um, here we have the covariance between the instrument, yit minus two, and the error term, delta uit. Again, we split it out, and this is the covariance of y i t minus two u i t minus the covariance of y i t minus two and u i t minus one and now this appears to work because we have t and t minus two so this is zero and then here we have t minus one and t minus two in both cases the the y happens before the u, and so we have that this y i t minus two is uh, satisfies the exogenated condition that we need for the instrument. But also we need the instrument to be relevant. So, um. Here we need the covariance between y i t minus two and the thing that we're trying to instrument for delta y i t minus one. Then if we write this down is the covariance between y i t minus two, y i t minus one minus the covariance of y i t minus two, y i T minus two. And I'm gonna do another step where I'm gonna replace this y i t minus one. So it's gonna be covariance of y i t minus two row 
y i t minus two plus um I should have done this earlier. Um, forget it. Um, yeah, I made a mistake here. Well, anyway, let's stick to it. 8i plus u i t minus 1. Okay, and so now when you look at this term over here, this is just the variance, okay, of y i t minus two. And then here we have t minus two here, t minus two here, and t minus one over here, okay? Um, and then this, will just be rho, the variance of y i t minus two minus the variance of y i t minus two is one minus rho variance of y i t minus two, which is different than zero given that we assume that rho is different than one. And so the instrument is relevant. It's exogenous and it's correlated with the object that you intend to um, um, what did I say? That you intend to um, instrument for. So these, the literature on dynamic panel models is large and includes a lot of things. And then, you know, if you ever, if you were ever exposed to these topics, you're gonna remember that, um, you know, YIT minus two is not, of course, the only instrument that you can use. You can use YIT minus three and T minus four and T minus five and so on. And so, you know, early on people say like, oh, this is the first paper. We'll say you can use this in as an instrument great and then you just use ib and then you know and then uh later on people say like oh you can use the other instruments t minus three t minus four and then led to things like you know Ariana bond and things like that but then people started realizing that be careful because if you start including all of these instruments the correlation here is going to be taking this woman of road to certain powers as you use you know older and older time periods so your instruments are going to start looking weak Okay, we talk about weak instruments, which is when correlations were um, between the instrument and the variable that you were trying to instrument for um, is, is weak. And so um, there are a lot of mechanical issues and, and solutions and, and also um, papers that propose different type of instruments and, and so on. Of course, a very popular paper in that is the one by Arigiano Bond, which is just say, looks, looks use some instruments and then do GMM, okay? So, um, um, but you know, if you just look at what's going on behind the curtain, and this is why sometimes I don't spend time in this type of models is it's all about for you to understand all those methods and papers. Well, it's all about the basic mechanics. If you understand GMM, you understand endogeneity, you understand the instrument, you understand what weak instruments are and so on. This literature is just about that. There's nothing special about it aside from the fact that this model is giving you that. The new aspects about this model are essentially in these two slides, where you just see how the combination of state dependence, state dependence, and time variant and uh, heterogeneity create issues uh, that do not appear when you don't have, for example, state dependence. So, other than this, the rest are mechanics. And if you just see, like, oh, how do you estimate a dynamic panel model where IB or GMM? Just tell me how many instruments you want to use, okay? and then just put them together, use the formulas that we had before. And there are even packages that will do that. Um, and then, you know, 
what's the limiting distribution of objects like this? Well, we'll have an asymptotic variance that will just take a sandwich form. And it will, in the robust case, it will just look like the robust standard errors. And the standard errors are going to look like cluster robust standard errors. And so dynamic panels have that as well. So um, that's what it is. But conceptually, that's the new element. All right. This is the end. Um, assuming that there could be more questions, I want to stop uh, the recordings now, and I want to answer the questions that you may have. Yeah.